Colleen Theodore, I'm the Assistant Curator of Programs here at the Gallery, and it is my pleasure to introduce Ned Cook, the Charles F. Montgomery Professor of American Decorative Arts at the History of Art Department here. He is the faculty representative of our governing board, and he is a regular. You can find him in galleries all the time. Um, the installation of 17th century Dutch paintings that you see here, largely made possible um, from a loan that we have from Rosemary and Ike Van Otterloo has made many wonderful things happen. I'm sure you heard John Walsh's lectures earlier this semester. We had students play music here. Um, students have engaged these works through the lens of trade, or brushwork, and today we get to hear about still lives and the objects within them from Ned Cook. Um, I want to just mention that these works will be reinstalled in about a week or two, so please come back and come back often for more surprises from the Van Otterloo collection. And I will turn it over to you. Great. Thanks so much, Marlene. I feel obligated to have a disclaimer if those of you who have um, heard John Walsh speak about uh, Dutch painting, that Dutch painting is not my expertise. Um, so I'm not going to get into the development of certain um, aesthetical um, kinds of treatments within um, these kinds of still lifes. And I'm going to particularly concentrate on the, uh, the three classes uh, here, nor the way some people have talked about um, still lifes and looking at objects, they oftentimes will look and use these paintings as illustrations of how objects were used at a particular point in time, um, sort of a static sense of illustrated history, um, if you will. But I actually want to talk about materiality. I want to talk about three different kinds of materials here um, and draw your eye into them and then start to work out from what you can do with that sense of materiality. So the three materials I want to work with you today are glass, ceramic, and metal. Um, and you can see them in all three um, paintings here um, depicting food on a table. You can see a glass rummer um, in this uh, Peter Claus painting. You can see another what's called a glass rummer and then as well as a uh, beaker um, in the same decorative style. And then in the Willem class, you can see a different um, glass set back next to the rummer. Um, and to me, you start to looking at the distinctions. Um, what do you see right away in terms of if you want to look at the rummer versus a Venetian wine glass? What, what is your eye drawn to? I'm sorry if, for those who are over there, but maybe people are over here. What, can you tease out something about it, what ways in which they might be different? So light reflection, um, which is which is more reflective, the rummer? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Anything else? The Venetian, I'm sorry, the Venetian okay. uh, stemware is much more delicate and. Okay, so where do you get the delicacy from it? I think that handle. I mean the mm -hmm. part of the stem. The stem in through here. Yeah. Well, and also. Mm -hmm. See, what's interesting is, you know, the center of the glass world in the 17th century is Venice. Um, they're the ones who are considered uh, at the top of the game in terms of glass, both in terms of the thinness of the glass, as well as their ability to work it hot, to twist it, uh, to oftentimes um, put colored rods together and do millefiori um, sorts of techniques. And the Dutch glass, which this is a reproduction um, of, what is it? I mean, it's, it's substantial. This one is you know, more bottle glass, so it isn't uh, quite as colorless. But you start thinking, rather than looping, twisting, um, and having that kind of intricate stem that intertwines through there, all you're doing is taking globs of hot glass instead of putting little buttons on here. Um, this sort of part in through here, and this is based on an archaeological example, is just simply wrapped on glass thread. Um, so it ends up being what I would call sort of quick and dirty glass work, um, as opposed to something that is much more refined. But the idea is to still embrace the aesthetics of glass. Um, how can you manipulate it um, so it's not simply a blown glass? And ideally, 
and it'd be wonderful to bring up um, down in the American Decorative Arts uh, section, there is a Venetian glass that's so delicate, um, you know, hard to sort of remove from the cases that are on view. But if I were to bring that up, um, it probably weighs about a third of this one. Um, it um, is extraordinarily thin uh, walled um, and very delicately made. So you've got a sense of sort of substance and delicacy um, going on within this sort of contrast and how substance um, and, and sort of local made materials um, sort of predominate within these others. If I were to switch to another material and think about metal um, in these three paintings, you've got a series of covered jars of plates. Um, you've got a tobacco box, more plates. You've got a plate a spilled over Taza, um, sort of a, uh, a stand. So what's going on? Is, is there a similarity between all these? What sort of material do you think this is? This shiny metal. Um, is it all pewter? So some people, don't, pewter is a tin alloy that has uh, copper antimony, maybe a little bit of lead um, in it as well. It's a cast material as opposed to oftentimes being hammered up, which is what silver would be. Knife is probably stainless steel with um, enamel or one over there has uh, mother of pearl um, kinds of uh, handles. Handles always going to be a separate material. No stainless steel. Stainless steel doesn't get used for tableware until World War II. So what do you think? Pewter or silver in through here? Silver. Pewter. So, which one you're saying that's silver? Mm -hmm. So, because it's reflective? Um, it's all pewter in that one. How about this example? What do you see in through here? So, you're saying picking up a little bit of gold in there, right? Or copper. Brass. Brass. It's a copper alloy. Brass. Yep. But what do you suppose the body is if it's, if it's a brass pewter? Very similar sorts of uh, workability of materials. Oftentimes, the same person works them. What about, see, we favor everybody sort of sequentially down, as we come down here. So what's this? It's like silver. Mm -hmm. Which one's silver? The Taza. Yeah. So again, this becomes a really interesting exercise in terms of this is not a museum object, John. This is mine, so I can use my fingers on this one. <laughs> um, but pewter has this ability, um, particularly when it's first uh, cast and finished and skimmed, it has a highly reflective finish. Um, it is you know, the equivalent of silver plate in the 17th century. Um, and pewter has a long history um, in the northern European swath of Germany um, on into the Netherlands. Um, it actually retains associations with place that, um, for instance, pewter in colonial America, one of the real um, enclaves for pewter consumption right into the uh, first quarter of the 19th century is Germanic settlements in Pennsylvania and up the Hudson River Valley. So there's, there's a deeper sense of pewter um, as opposed to ceramic um, kinds of tablewares um, that goes right on through that is tied into um, this kind of idea of tin, um, which is the German word for, uh, for pewter. And I think that you know, looking at these sorts of things, what you're really struck by also, um, if, and this is pewter, it's also cast, um, very simple but highly reflective. But if you think about the plainness of all this, and then you come to silver, and what are you immediately drawn by? Or, you know, you can see another silver Taza, probably the um, same one um, over there. What are you struck by? Um, how ornate it is, right? It's not sort of a simple cast form, but actually it's raised up, it's hammered, it's manipulated. Uh, the metal's pushed in and out um, so that you've got lobes um, in through here. You've got an intricate stem. You've got what's called repoussé chasing, where you're pushing the metal out and then chasing back in and defining uh, some of that space um, to, that gets that three-dimensional work. It's not 
you know, it's the equivalent of carving in wood, but it's actually movement of the metal um, under pressure. So there's the sense that there's a different kind of metal there, but also a different way of conceiving of form um, and decoration, um, as opposed to just sort of Cassian moldings um, that you might have along um, the uh, pewter rim. Then you might also um, look at ceramics, um, the third category that I talked about. And where do you see ceramics? Plates there. So plates here. Plates. We've got two plates here. So what kind of ceramic? I think those are. China. So somebody said Delft because they're thinking tin glazed earthenware because Delft is a production center um, in the Netherlands of blue and white uh, ceramics. But blue and white ceramics also are known in Chinese porcelain. Um, they're known in Staffordshire ceramics. But so to basically you might think of this as refined ceramics, um, tableware. It's got a degree of decoration. What do you suppose this is? Terracotta. What's, so we know it as terracotta. What's another way to thinking about it? If, if you have different uh, body types of ceramics, if you have earthenware, stoneware, and porcelain, what's terracotta? It's earthenware, right? And it's unglazed. It's oftentimes just intact. Um, so what do you suppose this is? What's, what's in that? Is it Brussels? Is it broccoli? Or what do you suppose is in there? Coal. It's coal. Yeah, it's a brazier. Um, brazier is something that would hold um, hot coals. So what are the hot coals for, do you think? Well, sometimes they're actually used, yeah, you'll find um, these little containers, braziers, and then also little pipkins, um, which are footed uh, sorts of earthenware containers um, with a glaze on the inside are oftentimes used uh, for sauces and kept near the hearth. Not, not for the tableware, but actually for the preparation of it. This is not near the hearth, but it's bringing the hearth to the table in some ways. So it could be used for heating. What else do you think it could be used for? That's a fish. Here's little splints um, that you could put a splint, um, you know, thin piece of wood into the brazier. It lights, you can light your tobacco for your pipe. So this is a sequence of different events uh, for tobacco smoking. No cigarettes at this time, it's all pipes. Um, and then down here, they've got something else that sort of comes, um, what's often known as a, uh, as a wax taper. It's, it's a uh, cord that's covered with wax that you light and it just burns slowly. Um, and oftentimes that's used as a lighting device as well. So you see the burning embers um, right down here. So we've looked at different kinds of materials, right? Um, and maybe in the past, people might have said something about a um, kind of Protestant um, kind of uh, simplification of pewter over um, a taza that looks more elaborate. Um, but actually, to me, what becomes a really interesting um, kind of tension within these is the idea of local production versus imported wares. And it was funny because I was talking to John Walsh about this and I said, you know, this is what's really got me interested in this um, sort of material. Because if you think about pewter being this local material that's embraced um, from um, a sense of Germanic and Northern European identity, and then to go to silver, and a lot of the silver um, in some ways this particular um, kind of decoration is much more sort of a Southern European. You can see some of this within Spain um, and even within Italy, that highly uh, kind of manneristic um, work um, that was not typical of a lot of the Dutch silver at this moment in time in the 1630s. Um, and so there's a tension about sort of local pewter imported kinds of silver. You think about the glass and what I was talking about in terms of the fact that there's Venetian glass here, delicate, um, finely wrought, um, manipulated versus kind of a utilitarian uh, kind of hot glass being produced uh, in the Netherlands. And then you think about ceramics. Um, and one of the things that's quite interesting about these two plates, if you look at them, the border, um, particularly on this one, is sort of the series of panels. Um, it's a 
very common kind of uh, early 17th century uh, Chinese porcelain pattern called crockware, uh, K-R-A-A-K, -A -A -K, that's sort of a compression of the word carrack, which is the Portuguese trading ships that would be plying from Lisbon to go up uh, around to Macau um, and Nagasaki and then come back, two-year voyage, actually, uh, four-year uh, round-trip voyage, actually, um, to go all the way from Lisbon to Nagasaki in Japan and back again. But the, croc, the carracks were oftentimes some of these early, um, late 16th century carriers of Chinese porcelain back to Europe. Um, and this was the kind of pattern that was coming out of the potteries in Chen down through Canton to Macau, back to Lisbon. Blue and white, Lisa, you said something about it being Delft, right? Um, what's interesting is that a lot of the Dutch uh, producers start to see these porcelains, and the VOC, VOC the, um, the Dutch East India Company, is trading very extensively in the early 17th century uh, from China. Um, they bring back some of this crockware too, and it becomes a very popular pattern that gets copied, that gets picked up um, by some of the uh, ceramic um, manufacturers in the Netherlands at this time. And actually there's a wonderful, um, again, something I couldn't bring up that's down in the American uh, Decorative Arts Galleries of two large uh, chargers side by side that are in the crock pattern. One's Chinese porcelain, one is Dutch, um, tin, what's tin glazed earthenware. So, What's distinctive is that China um, has porcelain, a high firing uh, white clay and petunzi, almost a sort of a feldspar um, kind of material that makes for a very strong, thinly potted um, kind of ceramic. That's why the whiteness of it um, and its durability, um, it became really uh, a popular kind of fashion in the 17th century. The, in Europe, uh, in the Netherlands, they didn't have um, the secret for producing porcelain. It becomes actually a competition amongst all the courts. Um, you know, Meissen is, comes out of the German developments uh, in the 18th century. Sevres comes out of the French royal court. Everyone's trying to make their own porcelain. But in the 17th century, no one had, um, no one had figured out how to make that kind of porcelainous uh, clay. But what they had done was figured out how to take either uh, in the Netherlands, sort of a, a gray earthenware body, and they would coat it with tin oxide, uh, which is a, a white kind of powder, um, and could then um, paint uh, with uh, and fire it with a blue cobalt paint, and that would actually provide a skin uh, that became a blue and white skin, um, such as you see in a lot of Delft uh, tiles, etc. But what's interesting is tin for the tin oxide um, can be expensive. Um, and again, so, so pewter is not inexpensive either because that's a tin alloy. But they were so parsimonious um, in their use of tin in the Dutch potting industry that they only put tin on the inside, the visible part. If you looked at the underside, the back of anything coming out of the Netherlands, it would be simply a lead glazed earthenware. So it'd be sort of orangish um, or um, cream, a little more cream colored on the backside. They didn't waste the tin oxide on what wasn't to be seen, because oftentimes these are plates that would be seen either on the table or up um, on some sort of a rail above the fireplace, uh, above the costin, uh, and various other forms of furniture. So you look at this, and it becomes a really interesting uh, kind of dilemma, because you could easily say it's Delftware, but by the fact that it's all painted on the underside indicates it's probably Chinese porcelain. And at the same time, the ways in which earthenware is obviously what the basis of the Dutch um, kind of ceramic tradition is, whether it's unglazed and what you refer to as terracotta or whether it's tin glazed and covered. And actually go downstairs um, in the American Decorative Arts Gallery and you know, without bothering the guards, see if you can sort of look around um, that vitrine and you can actually see the backside of the Dutch is totally plain. Um, but what it does is it sort of, that symbolizes to me so much about what the Dutch really represent in the 17th century when, uh, you know, many times people like Simon Schama talked about embarrassment of riches, sort of the, the economy um, of the 17th century in the Netherlands. But to me, what becomes a fascinating story is this idea of an import-export economy. 
Um, if you think about what the VOC is representing um, and the fact that they are bringing trade goods from um, East Asia, Southeast Asia, um, as part of the spice trade and various other things. Batavia is, their, is basically the second capital of the Dutch world. Um, so they're bringing all these goods back to the Netherlands, some of these porcelains. Um, they're bringing silks. Um, they're bringing other uh, sorts of material goods in addition to spices. But they don't necessarily then re-export them. What they do actually interestingly enough, is they sort of bring them in, they study them up, and they copy them. So it's, it's one of the great copying economies that the tin-glazed earthenware from Delft is sort of them absorbing um, the ideas of the VOC. And as we know, sort of um, with our whole discussion about NAFTA and various other trade treaties, if you're just engaged in exchanging goods, you only get part of the profit. Um, what the Dutch had figured out is you get some of the goods in, you can support and, and merchants can sell, but if you can then get the producers who are native in the Netherlands who cannot really sort of do enough in terms of an agricultural economy, they need an export business. So what they do is tin glazed earthenware, um, silks, pewter starts getting shipped out. So they're bringing in sort of what you might consider the high end goods and they're shipping out what you would call mid range goods. And it's that kind of trade that I think actually builds up um, this kind of wealth. And you can get a sense of some of these notions about that local and the extra local. Um, and as I was talking to John Walsh about these ideas, he goes, well, it's, actually, that's just what's going on in terms of the flower paintings. You know, there's a way in which they are celebrating what are local flowers and then what are imported flowers. One only has to think about tulips and what the tulips represent in terms of something being brought in uh, as well as at that moment. So that fascination, um, sort of a thinking globally, acting uh, kind of locally to then re-engage with the global world. And I thought, you know, there's one other object um, that's, you know, a, a similar one that's uh, imported here. Get my gloves out. But if, if you thought about the um, tobacco box um, here, um, as well as uh, in the middle picture, and to think about that tobacco, and again, tobacco, where's it coming from? It's coming from Virginia. Um, it's coming on the Atlantic trade, being brought in, and it's consumed um, within clay pipes. But tobacco boxes. So this one we looked at and we were thinking pewter, it's sort of um, with that brass uh, kind of molding along the base. It's sort of a table um, kind of tobacco box. And yet there are also a number of brass boxes that are being produced. Um, and oftentimes these are more decorative in terms of being uh, slightly embossed, um, sometimes engraved, and oftentimes decorated with either of two kinds of uh, motifs. One is home ports, Rotterdam, Amsterdam, various things like that, or perhaps parables of um, prodigal sons. Um, and sort of this idea of an object that reminds you of home or that calls to mind your sort of uh, obligations um, to one's home port um, or home family. This is a portable kind of tobacco box. It goes with you. Um, and so, if you're in Batavia, um, if you're in Ceylon, um, the number of other uh, Cape Town, the other Dutch ports that they inherit from the Portuguese trade, this is their bit of home that's going with them. Um, and the brass and copper industry was another one of these uh, businesses that is exporting a fair amount of uh, copper alloys throughout the world. In fact, if you looked at uh, 17th century brass work um, in colonial America, um, actually, a small percentage of it is, is English. Um, most of it is Dutch or um, possibly Spanish earlier on and possibly Scandinavian later on. Um, but that whole notion that this becomes a piece of home that you take on the road with you, this substitutes for the kind of work that you might have just set uh, on the table. And that whole idea of sort of the conviviality of smoking. Um, and the ways in which the clay pipe, the white kaolin uh, clay pipe being produced, um, very distinctive in terms of having that kind of length to it. And the numbers of boxes, um, you know, not only to boxes for your tobacco, but people would start um, 
asking local craftspeople um, to produce boxes to protect their long stem pipes. And you can see from the Dutch who are trading um, in the second half of the 17th century in Nagasaki um, with Japan, they have these intricately maki lacquered boxes um, in the shape of these pipes, you know, little bowls in, in the stem to keep it preserved. Um, they've got um, those who went to India to Gujar near Gujarat, they would have um, mother of pearl shingled uh, sorts of boxes. Wherever you were, you, know, you wanted to get this kind of protective element uh, for that pipe. And so I start looking at these um, paintings and I start thinking in a very different sense um, about the Dutch world in the 1620s and 1630s of something that's um, <coughs> right at this point inheriting, uh, taking over uh, the Portuguese routes uh, through uh, the Indian Ocean and Southeast Asian trades, um, the ways in which local production is starting to gear up and some of these tensions of that kind of importation uh, and exportation really start to come alive um, and play out um, in significant ways. I thought one last thing besides just the three still lifes and, and obviously the way in which the domestic world is portrayed, um, I really like Gabriel Metsu's uh, paintings in terms of his kind of interior scenes. Um, and they again remind us of a of a different world than the ways in which we might be thinking about, say, from a colonial American point of view. Um, one of which is it remains, the Dutch world is um, in, intensely a ceramic world around the fireplace. Um, I'd mentioned with the brazier of having that sort of unglazed earthenware, but you look at a typical uh, kind of Dutch fireplace and they're almost all ceramic cooking vessels. Um, here's you know, the equivalent in sort of an Anglo world or an Anglo-American world would be a big cast iron pot um, that you'd have hanging um, by the crane over the, over the open fire. But you look at a lot of the metsu and other um, kinds of uh, paintings of interior scenes of maids asleep at the fireplace, they're always surrounded by ceramics and they have um, lead glazed earthenware colanders, um, something that I'd be scared to try to use to sort of rinse something out, um, of these large cooking kettles. Um, and they oftentimes have, you know, three legs. It's sort of that same form that you see in iron um, or in bronze uh, in an Anglo fireplace, but it's this kind of ceramic world. And it's what's actually coming up in a lot of the archaeological work in uh, Albany um, uh, as well as in New York City. And then even sort of the fact that they've got um, one of these uh, freshen um, down in the Rhine, uh, these stoneware uh, bottles um, that has sort of a imprinted uh, coat of arms on it, but oftentimes with pewter um, on top. And again, you know, this is a form that actually exists in two different uh, fashions. Um, there are some of these bottles that have no pewter, um, and actually those are the ones you oftentimes find in England and colonial America. And then there are a number of these that have pewter, um, and the idea for wine and beer to keep it covered, um, to have a pewter covered. And I just, one of the objects I oftentimes use um, in terms of teaching, shards are great um, at times, but to think about this is simply um, a, covered mug of stoneware, in this case a Vesterwald um, sort of gray stoneware piece. But you know, the idea of the pewter lid um, being an important part of that kind of ceramic container um, that you don't see, as I said, um, in kind of the Anglo world. This is, ends up being another one of these Dutch uh, kinds of conventions. And again, sort of reinforces that notion about what's the deeper symbolic meaning of pewter um, that you know, we oftentimes tend to think of as only a durable um, kind of tableware, um, and if you dent it, um, you can always melt it down and then make it uh, cast a new piece. But there's a way in which I think pewter retains something beyond um, its sort of straightforward exchange value, its, its uh, functional value, um, that it does have this other kind of connotation within the Dutch world. So I, you know, I hope just by doing this short, um, kind of presentation looking at these sorts of odd uh, paintings and thinking that there's more here than simply sort of establishing um, a sense of the development of still life um, over time. We can appreciate um, the kind of 
way in which they've captured the essence, the, the, the reflection that you were talking about within some of the glass um, and other objects, the, the materiality, but not to use it simply as backdrop, not simply as simply saying, oh, I can document the use of um, crockware in, uh, in the Netherlands in 1633 or something like that, but how do you then take these objects and ask the question of them, so ultimately, what do they mean? How can you really sort of derive some ideas from the objects themselves and push outward into some larger questions? And to me, this is where we start to um, think about that kind of way in which the Dutch economy comes alive um, beyond just sort of um, what you might think of looking at the landscape views, thinking of a, and just sort of imagining the difficulties of gaining a livelihood um, below sea level um, in that kind of climate and how it was maritime trade but it was also very much connected to that was a production cycle in producing um, these kinds of goods. I almost, there's a part of me that thinks of, um, of the Netherlands in the 17th century as sort of the equivalent to Japan in the 1960s um, of taking you know, in the case of cameras, taking German cameras um, or um, sort of uh, stereophonic equipment and then sort of reducing it, simplifying it, and then producing it in a much more affordable way. That's what the Dutch ceramicists were doing. It's what their metal workers were doing. They were taking those ideas and transforming them and that way leading to a boom economy um, at that time. I'd be happy to answer questions that people might have um, Details, whatever. Yes? Would the content of the paintings be possessions of the artist, or was he choosing things because of his patrons' like for things? Usually they're doing this in their own studio, um, as opposed to portraiture, which sometimes they might come and sit in, sometimes you might, um, but most of the time, and it's what you see, you know, it's, it's the painterly tradition is to have a studio with, with lots of props um, in them. So they collected these things? Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> yes? It seems that the glass is all tinted kind of green. I don't mm -hmm. know if it's wrong, but is there a reason for that? That's, that's glass yeah, I mean, most glass, it's what I refer to as bottle glass or window glass. Um, so there's slight impurities. Um, and with that, oftentimes it's due to some of the iron uh, in it. The idea of totally clear, colorless glass, the Venetians are able to, but even then some of them have crizzled and clad a little bit. Um, the way we tend to think about sort of real colorless glass, and John's writing on all this stuff now, it's the 20th century, um, sort of thinking about Stuben um, and Corning um, kind of formulas that they're developing, which are t connected into German glass, um, and Scandinavian glass. Um, I mean, the German glass of having that really high temperature glass is of what, a late 19th century kind of construct. So but when we tend to think of it, um, you know, you're thinking Stuben glass, right? Absolutely crystally, um, kind of clear. But most of the stuff, even in the 18th century of the English leaded glass, that if you look at wine glasses, it's still not quite there, but the greenish tint is very much a part of standard glass in the 17th century. Good eye. Yep. How about the woods? You know the pipe and the wood mm -hmm. and the table. Yep. The wooden table. The um, the pipes are clay. Clay. Oh. Like this. Mm -hmm. That's. Okay. This is the equivalent of just. It's a very light um, kale and clay pipe that's pressed. Is that right? Yep. Looks that good. And you um, can see. And one of these, um, which one has the, this is a broken stem, or this does right here. See this little broken yeah, stem right, right there. Um, the woods I haven't gone into um, in terms of the kinds of woods that the Dutch are using in their furniture. Um, it tends to be both local kinds of conifers, uh, local walnuts, um, but they also are importing woods as part of the trade um, in the way of ebony and things like that. Where's your table? Yes, Lisa? about the clay pipe. Uh-huh. It was 
also used to be. Was that something that the Dutch developed, or was that something that was developed elsewhere and brought to? I don't know where the origin. I mean, what the interesting thing about the Dutch is that they're longer pipes. Um, the English pipes tend. That's basically an English pipe. It's a shorter uh, sort of a stem, but you know. Where does one get pipes? Uh, you know, the Native Americans are using tobacco um, earlier, um, and oftentimes using soapstone and things like that. But those tend to be shorter um, because you're carving the soapstone before it oxidizes, before it hardens. So it's it's like soap that you carve into, and then it sets up and becomes really hard. But um, those later that you know the. the kinds of pipes that people think about with Native Americans in terms of peace treaties in the 19th century, longer ones, those, there's not the archaeological evidence, say, in the 17th century for that. So I don't know, I don't know what the source of that is. But were there pipes in China? There were opium. pipes, well, opium trade is sort of later, yeah. Um, but I think at that point, you know, people are always looking for just as much as there is sort of tea drinking or drinking of ground up um, kinds of natural material, um, I think that there's sort of one of those universal um, modes of, of smoke um, as a, you know, the whole way in which we tend to think of it as a recreational um, sort of endeavor, but at that point um, it has all sorts of medicinal, spiritual, and so many other uh, kinds of facets, and I think that's where a lot of it got started. We'll have to find out about where. Sorry. Well, clay pipe. I mean, I'm thinking particularly about clay pipes um, in some ways. Yeah. I was thinking about too. Yeah. I mean, it, and it, it is a pipe culture as opposed to, you know, later on. It's only later on in the late 19th century that you start to get into cigarettes um, and things like that. Did the Dutch grow their own tobacco or import? imported? Imported. Yeah. That's what America was fueling tobacco and beaver skins for hats and fashion. Well, they're wonderful paintings, and it's been really nice to have both the still lifes as well as sort of the interior scenes that sort of evoke a sense of that kind of material world and the way in which objects will mediate relationships, um, both sort of in the usual um, kind of drunken um, sort of debauchery and having pockets uh, picked by uh, women of the night uh, in the other room, um, or simply sort of the quotidian um, sort of person at home um, that you have here. And, and to me, it's, it is a sort of capturing of domesticity uh, and the idea of home um, and where things fit in terms of home and upsetting um, the kind of normal um, boundaries of gender and propriety, um, which is in essence what's going on in the other room. But to me, what it does is it still sort of reflects on the way of, uh, of a material world uh, in 17th century ne Netherlands. So much of it is wealth is generated from it, but also relations are defined um, by these very sorts of objects in the materiality. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.